Um, so I think we're ready for, let's see, who is number 17? Clinical implication. Clinical implication, so that's David Adams. And you just need to be hooked up here and you should be ready to go. But, uh, but yeah, I think to the degree that maybe refine this table a bit in, in the paper, um, that would be very helpful. It, it might also, just, just to take a step back and think about the, the first things that you do when you find a novel gene, so is the gene expressed in the tissue that's re related to the disease, those types of things, I mean, just seem like a, you know, a, a good first step. If it's actually expressed, then that helps, it increases plausibility. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. So we've talked extensively about all the things that we don't know and that are hard to know, so I'm going to talk about how to use all that glorious uncertainty in the clinic. Um, this is the uh, group of people in our working group, and um, the, as with some of the previous speakers, the stuff that we wrote down in the, um, in the outline was a group effort, but this is largely mine, so I invite clarification and uh, corrections if needed. I should mention that Ewan offered to change his name to David, but uh, <laughs> in retrospect, I don't think he was serious. Um, so I'm going to talk about five brief sections. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about a specific context that we've touched on today but haven't talked about explicitly, which is um, the, the clinical context, the, actually the, the practice of using these in the clinic. Um, I'd like to talk about communicating variant information and returning results and uh, a composite clinical example and then um, it, talking about how a report might be, might be formatted for clinical use. So to many clinicians, next generation sequencing might mean several things. It might mean a way to simultaneously test many known candidate genes quickly and inexpensively, and this is formalized, of course, in uh, gene panels which are available for purchase. It may be considered to be something that's used by researchers to find genetic causes of disease that are rare or common, but really this devolves into Sanger sequencing eventually. So if the field decides that a variant is important, then eventually it's going to be offered as a clinical test and it's not really going to um, come up in this sphere. So what I'm going to focus on is the clinical test that's used to look for unspecified or novel diagnoses in single individuals and families. And unfortunately, given our conversations this morning, most of these will be similar but not identical to known diseases and other known families. And again, they'll usually be single individuals or, or small. Many of them will have neurologic phenotypes and things like developmental delay and cognitive impairment, which are um, somewhat nonspecific. So we all know that there's a wide spectrum of clinical uses for um, genetic testing. And I would say that they cover a, a spectrum of uh, requirement for uh, certainty and the use of uh, clinical judgment. So for instance, you want to be very certain for pre-implementation testing or the recommendation for a prophylactic mastectomy. However, you might use a little bit more um, judgment if you've got a low probability variant but you're considering a life-saving therapy. Um, and in some cases, the diagnosis itself may be therapeutic, especially for instance when parents feel guilty about disease uh, causation. So this, um, to be able to use this clinical judgment, a clinician needs to have enough in information to um, determine what the strength of the evidence is. Um, we also, our group talked about the division between reporting DNA sequence variants, and actually there's some good um, standards that have been published for reporting variants. Clearly it's still a difficult issue, but there are standards available for saying how you should go about this. There are less, there are fewer standards available for talking about gene implication. So in some ways this is a particular feature of next generation sequencing because it's um, for all but a few genes, it's non-hypothesis driven. You're testing things where you don't know what to do with the, the results of the test, which is in general um, not favorable for clinical testing, but that's what you do. Um, and this may benefit from a scoring rubric to categorize levels of evidence for gene implication. Obviously, biological implication is easy to hypothesize, but it's also, as we've said over and over, um, easy to overstate the evidence as well. I'm not going to go through this in detail. Um, David Dimick mentioned that they, at their institution, they had a, a scoring rubric for, um, for gene causation, which might be useful to put into reports. Um, a few general principles. Next generation sequence generally arrives in the clinical setting as a report. So this is generally how it's communicated from the testing site to the clinical setting. And 
of course, some results should be immediately apparent and highlighted in such a report. So things that are clinically actionable, um, variants uh, with severe health consequences, and actually there's an American College of Medical Genetics set of recommendations that's pending about some specific genes that should be looked at that are in this category. But I would say that the final responsibility for interpreting and returning results really resides with the ordering clinician. And so when a report includes a phrase like variant of unknown significance, basically that's transferring some of the burden of interpretation uh, to the physician, and they may might decide that that's enough for clinical action or not, for instance, if it's the second variant in a gene that they're highly suspicious of. Um, the use of consultants, of course, may be necessary, and that might include the testing laboratory, but I think that we need to think about empowering the clinician to be able to weigh the uh, evidence for data used in this manner. Of course, the, very, the level of expertise for any given variant or gene will vary among clinicians. It may be a gene they're familiar with, it may not be, and the same is true for their ability to analyze raw next generation sequence data, and by raw, I mean even a variant list. So the central issue here is how is uncertainty conveyed from the testing site to the clinician and from the clinician to the patient? So we want to be able to provide enough information to the clinician to allow this clinical decision making, but we don't want to impo uh, bury important information in a mass of data, and we can't assume an excessively high level of analytic expertise of the clinician. So this is an example of a uh, SNP array report, and they found a 15 megabyte region of uh, contiguous homozygosity, and they recommended that the pediatrician uh, type this into um, the UCSC genome browser and see if they could find something interesting. And I would recommend that this is maybe a paucity of interpretation. Um, so reports should, I feel that re, uh, reports should err on the side of providing more information rather than oversimplification. And for the purposes of this group, I think that it would be good if we could think about any opportunities to standardize the language we use to communicate um, the uncertainty and analytic techniques we're going to use. So next I'm going to give a little clinical vignette. It's a, a pastiche of a couple of different um, cases that we've had, but the reason why I bring it up is I wanted to use it to illustrate how clinical information is passing through the clinic as it's currently being used, clinical uh, exome information. So imagine a family with a child with a complex, severe medical uh, syndrome which really destroyed the family's um, life. Conventional testing does not provide a diagnosis and a clinical exome sequence is obtained commercially. So the lab director carefully analyzes the data, doesn't find any known genes that would explain the phenotype, um, and se some secondary variants uh, are reported back. So six months pass, and the patient sent to a consultant who has just read about a gene that looks very similar to the family. Um, five families are reported with similar signs and sin, uh, symptoms, a knockdown, and a zebrafish showed a phenotype that was similar to the affected families, and we've just talked about the complicated nature of that data. And the consultant wants to see if the exome sequence detected any variants in this gene. Um, the gene isn't commented in, in the report, which is not surprising since it uh, wasn't a known disease-associated gene when the two-page report was assembled. Um, the testing lab is hesitant to return a full variant list because it includes variants that have not been CLIA certified and are not, um, may vary in quality, but eventually the consultant gets a copy of the um, report. And she notices that there are no coding variants in the gene she was interested in. However, there's also no indication of how well the gene was covered by the exome sequencing. So she turns to a research colleague who agrees to sequence the gene, doesn't find any variants in the gene, and he wants to look at the exome sequence. And he searches the variant lists and finds some variants in a different gene in the same pathway. The new gene is not known to cause human disease, but based on well-known cell biology, the mutations in the gene that he has found are predicted to alter cell physiology in the same way as mutations uh, in the known gene. And of course, at this point, the family calls their primary clinician to tell her that they are 10 weeks pregnant, and they would like to know if the follow-up work on the exome sequence detected anything they could use to test the current pregnancy. So all of the parts of these, I would say, are bread and butter medical genomics at this point. I mean, all this stuff happens pretty regularly. So there's lots of things we could talk about with that vignette. I'm actually more impressed with the specific ones that we had before for that purpose. So I'd like to mainly talk about um, 
communicating exome results. So the current standard in the labs that we surveyed a couple of months ago and the reports that we've gotten back um, when families bring in exomes that are done before they come to us is, is that they get only results that are deemed to be important by the testing laboratory on a couple pieces of paper. Um, you could imagine returning a larger prioritized list. You could return selected categories of results. Um, or uh, you could return all of the results in an annotated form with a summary of the important finding, findings. And I like to call this the radiology model, where you might get a DVD back. Um, this would, of course, require, once again, standardized annotation. Um, and you could run the risk of overwhelming an inexpert interpreter if the summary was inadequate, but this does uh, uh, give a lot back as far as um, data portability. And many patients have come back to us and argued that even though the sequence they obtained was done under uh, the auspices of a research study, it was done on them and they should own the data ultimately. And if they actually paid for it out of pocket, which has happened too, then they may have a good argument. Um, so what's in an optimal report for clinical use? Well, quantitative information, if possible, about pathogenicity, and we've talked about that quite a bit today, how difficult that uh, is to do, but also for disease association with a gene that you're um, presenting that's not a known gene. Um, information about how the analysis was done, um, analysis assumptions, information about control populations used in the analysis because if in, uh, incorrect control populations are used, of course, you could think something is rare when it's not rare, it's just not present in the control population. And then uh, limitations of the analytical methods. There are some general ones which I think are usually included. but. Um, what might also be useful is specific information about what was covered and not covered in that exome sequencing instance. And all of these data um, need standardization if they're going to be readily interpretable and comparable in a clinical setting. So we looked at um, six different testing sites as part of a, a talk we were preparing at one point. And the, the issue that I just want to point out here is, is that there are, um, there uh, there's a lot of discrepancy between what different sites are doing, whether they require family DNA, whether they do paternal exomes, whether they return secondary variants, whether they return variants to kids. So the field is evolving quickly, and perhaps that, that's a reason why what we're doing here um, has some good potential. Um, this is a, a graph I prepared a while ago. Along the left-hand side is number of variants and log scale. Along the bottom are variant analysis. Uh, analyses. So this is a, a filtering pipeline. And I originally used this to show that the, the red cases and the black cases differ by the use of family data. So you get fewer variants if you use family data. But the point I want to make is, is that there are assumptions made at each one of these filtration steps. And those assumptions are generally not put into a report um, that is uh, sent to a family uh, currently in a clinical setting. I think that we, the how uh, exome studies and next generation studies fail is also not communicated very well. So for instance, if you send off Sanger sequencing for an entire gene and you get a result back that says that they didn't find anything, it's a reasonable assumption to make that everything was pretty well covered, that it was high quality sequence and that they excluded the presence of uh, variants in that gene. Of course, we all know of exceptions, but in general that's, that's true. And if you're the analyst, you can say on the top, well, that's good quality sequence. I can make good calls. By the time you get down to a baseline that looks like the bottom, you might say, I just need to redo that data. Um, it's not good. And that would be a standard part of doing a um, uh, CLIA testing using Sanger. But for next gen sequencing, you get a report back and you have no idea what was covered and what wasn't covered. You don't get a profile of quality over genes that have, may have been of interest to you. And in fact, you tend to get reports back that look more like this, that have single summary statistics that don't tell you, again, anything about a specific, um, a specific gene. And of course, as we know, coverage can be useful, but it also can be um, misleading in cases of um, compressions and misalignment issues. So we had a number of questions which I'll uh, finish up with. One is, is that basically are there different thresholds for publication and clinical use of data? Um, for publication, a high evidence cutoff may inhibit dissemination of information. We've talked about that quite a bit. An inadequate excessive statement of evidence may lead um, to unintentional clinical use. And we see that with uh, the um, HDMD that things get published and acted on with inadequate evidence. Uh, for clinical use, a high cutoff doesn't allow for clinical judgment. Um, and 
uh, specifically if, if the lab director says I'm just going to put variants in this that I'm very, very sure about, then you don't allow the clinician to make a judgment about other variants that might be significant if the entire clinical story was known. And I think we're all familiar with the fact that in many cases when uh, tests are required, even exome tests, the amount of phenotype information that the testing lab gets is not sufficient, not as much as that you want to make um, even for the lab director to uh, understand the full scope of the phenotype. Um, and then a low cutoff may, of course, lead to medical error or patient harm if it's not flagged correctly. Um, another thought that we had was is that common disease will be particularly challenging. I think that this is true for many reasons. In the clinical setting, I would just say that um, with many stakeholders, often you end up with a large body of self-contradictory literature and the MTHFR C677 C, um, C to T mutation is a, is a good example of that. So, uh, as instructed, I tried to trim some things and finish up nice and early. So uh, as far as questions, um, they include how much next generation analytic detail should be included in a clinical report? Should we make a recommendation about that? Can analytic results and procedures be reported in a standardized manner? Um, what's the best way to report clinical uh, next gen study data? Um, are there different criteria for publication and clinical use? Are there different criteria for different um, clinical uh, settings, different clinical situations. Um, is the next generation study a one-time measurement or a reusable resource for the patient that they can come back to over time? Does it expire? Um, and at the end of the day, should a gene that is not well known to be associated with the presenting phenotype ever be reported or, or flagged in a study, or is that just an inappropriate place for it? Thanks. Thanks. And Mike, if you could reset our, our, our timer then. So, so lots of good questions that were, were asked. Um, David Goldstein and then Heidi and then Stilianos and Les. So, so I, really, I really like the idea um, that there would be a strong argument made that you know, the full sequence data in some sense should be part of the, of the report when you order a, a sequence. But th that does then you, leave you with the question, um, who's going to be charged with setting up the infrastructure to be able to make use of it. So, you know, one would like to be able to interrogate a gene of interest and say, was it covered or not? So, you know, the clinical, um, clinical geneticist is, is, is not going to be extracting that information from the BAM files. So if, if, if this is the direction, then what is the idea about the infrastructure for being able to actually make use of these data over time? Well, I'm glad that you asked that because I like this idea. Um, I think that, again, the radiology model, there are the images there and there's a reader there. And so you can put some infrastructure there. Now, are you going to be able to realign the data? No. But with a fairly minimal amount of, um, of software, you would have the ability to go and look at individual variants, to search through them for a gene of interest, maybe to look at some annotations of, um, about whether they're homozygous quality annotations, and you could also have the BAM file on there that somebody that was expert, if they went to a tertiary care center, could pull off and make into FASTQ files again. But you could, uh, as far as the DVD went, you could at least use something like um, the, uh, the genome viewer to go and look at specific um, uh, alignments to see whether there was a misalignment and an error if you got that expertise. Just so I can clarify that, because I, I also like this, but the suggestion is it's actually that the point of care would have at least a basic infrastructure to be able to do those things. That's what you're, that's what you're suggesting as the radiology model. Is that, is, that, is that right? Well, so when I get a radiology study on a CD, it's got the software on it. So I don't need anything else except for that, that DVD. Now, clearly, there are levels upon levels of expertise that are needed, and some people are going to be able to make more use of that than others. But that's true for the radiology study, too. If I get a complex MRI and send it off to who knows where, they're just going to read the study and they're not going to reanalyze it. If they have their own pediatric neuroradiologist, they can go in and do a more in-depth reanalysis of the data. So just some general comments. Um, so there's a, a work group at ACMG that, that I'm chairing to write and address almost all of these. And that guideline is actually just finished yesterday um, to be distributed to various stages of the process, getting it through ACMG. Um, and so I guess the, I could comment on what our opinion is in this document on a few of these, if it would be useful. Um, 
and then there's some of this we haven't fully addressed, and, and the, there's I have my own personal opinions. But um, you know, one of the things that we've stated, for example, is if you have a patient with a phenotype that is a clearly defined phenotype for which there's clinical testing available, then that report has to contain um, detailed coverage for the genes that are relevant to that patient's phenotype. Now, obviously, if you have a phenotype that doesn't have a clear test out there, then that's difficult to do. Um, so there's both the reporting of general details about how much of the genome or exome you've covered and at what depth, but then getting into those specifics when you've got a patient with Noonan syndrome and there are 10 genes known to cause Noonan syndrome, right? So could I, I can interrupt you and ask a question about that? Because let's say that you do an exome sequence and you don't get the, you don't get MECP2 at all. Are you obligated to go back and do Sanger sequencing or something else and, and figure that out through a separate technique if needed? So you are obligated to do whatever it is your test specifies. So if your methodology says we sequence the genome and we, we guarantee that we will achieve an average coverage of X and complete at least X percent of that genome or exome, then if you have met that technical standard that you have defined in your SOP and validation studies, then it doesn't matter that you missed an entire gene, you've hit your specified threshold. Now, obviously, that's completely suboptimal for the utility of that test in that patient with that, you know, Rett syndrome phenotype, which is why we've said you need to go in and actually specify what genes you've covered and to what extent for that specific phenotype. I will say there are, is at least one lab I heard of, I think it's UCLA is doing this, where they are putting on their website their average coverage on a per gene basis. So a physician could actually go in and say, well, my patient's got Rett syndrome. I could go order the, the Rett test, you know, uh, for MECP2, but, may, but there could be something else going on. The test is only X sensitive, so maybe I'll start with an exome. But let me go check and see what the coverage is for the three genes or one gene that I know about for that phenotype so you could at least have some inkling going into the game what you're likely to hit on that particular gene because there is some reproducibility there with respect to each of the genes. And, and you know, at the end of the day, I, the question is what do we recommend for labs in terms of baseline requirements versus what are the things that is simply lets a lab differentiate itself from other labs? Um, and so we actually talked about that specific thing. Should we require labs to post on their websites what they cover? And we ended up deciding that it wasn't a requirement, but I said, that's a terrific idea. And gee, I could probably get more business if I did good things like that. You know, so some things you, you just have to leave to labs to differentiate their services. And other things you have to say, this is a minimal standard. And I think trying to decide between those two things is, is sometimes challenging, but, but things that we need to do. Um, so um, we also had an extensive conversation about whether to return um, results from unknown genes. Um, and there is a group that, uh, a clinical group that says in clinical use this should really be the so-called clinical exome, which is all those genes for which there is an associated phenotype, and exclude the, the non-clinical exome from analysis. But if someone would like their genome that was negative sent to a research lab to pursue that question, then they can. Um, there's a, the other body of individuals who disagree with that and say, you know, we can figure some things out here. Um, we should be allowed to. Um, and what the group that won was, <laughs> yes, we should allow labs to delve into this territory. It is tricky. Um, and, you know, that's why I was asking David that question yesterday about the debating whether to return that result, which is clearly inconclusive because there wasn't enough evidence to implicate that gene in the patient's phenotype, yet maybe there's a higher likelihood that result will be pursued in subsequent assessments if, you know, it was in fact returned albeit with the uncertainty conveyed. So, so right now the, the guidelines are stating that, that that is okay in a clinical report to return, but you have to make some plausible arguments for why that, you know, is a potential cause. Now, we, that gets back to the whole point of all of us gathering here is what makes a plausible argument, um, and we were not able to even get into specifying that, the answer to that. Um, so. That's just a few comments. I can, you know, comment on other things if people were interested. 
we had Stilianos next, but did anyone want to follow up specifically on Heidi's comments? Yeah, so, so Gonzalo and, and Ben, and then we'll go back to uh, Stilianos. So, so on the last of uh, your comments, Heidi, I think that actually the last one is actually probably a good topic for a research study, you know? So I think it's not so clear what, I mean, it seems to me that you, you can't not, not return it ever. You know, if people request, then it's, it's a test that you did on them, and I think people have a right to know. And, and probably in medicine, people return all sorts of results that ha are ambiguous and cause worry, and no one is really sure what they mean all the time. But in general, is it a good thing to do? You know, will it sometimes help diagnose things, or will it just cause anxiety? That's probably a testable thing. You could say, if we use some standard to return those, how often would it lead to a new cause, and how often would it not, right? So, mm -hmm. and I think there's probably not the literature out there to tell. Um, you know, with, with your earlier point about, um, you know, analytic detail and coverage about genes, you know, in, in the context of ESP, you know, for example, we tried to report, you know, regions that had high coverage and so where we thought we would be able to call perhaps. And for example, in the context of uh, 1,000 genomes, we actually went one step further and in addition to ha talking about coverage, we actually had this, uh, we defined a mask for the genome where we thought we could analyze it with the highest confidence. And actually, we had two levels for that. And on the strictest level, we only said, you know, said, you know, 70% of the genome, we have the highest confidence. The, the, the other bits, we think that we'll have a higher rate of errors, you know. And actually, coming up with a way to define, you know, what the current state of technology is, what you can do really well, and what's the regions for improvement, you know, over time that might help you decide, you know, is it a one-time resource or is it time to redo it? You know, you could say, you know, for this patient, I'm interested in these genes, and actually I think the analysis of these genes now is much better because now that I have longer reads or better quality mapping or something, the, the data there is, is clearly more definite or something. Yeah, I, I, I think what I was going to say was basically almost exactly what Gonzalez said at the end, which is um, we found it useful rather than as much as I love coverage as much as anybody that one could phrase it in terms of power to um, discover a variant if it were to exist given the error model and the data that you use to generate the call. That gives you a profile of how well the experiment has worked and then you can go back later and say, you know, this experiment worked well for this part of the gene or that I was interested in, but not so well for this part of the gene, maybe at some point, as Gonzalo points out, that activates future experiments. But like just emitting like 30x coverage probably kills most of the genome pretty well, but maybe not all of it. And, and it certainly isn't granular enough that you, you, you want more detail than that. And I think quantifying it in power to discover were it to exist makes sense. Still, honest. thanks for being so patient. So. Uh, I'm wondering how important is the informed consent in the, all this flow of information and the disclosure of incidental findings or findings or findings on actionable variants. Actually, is, is there a list of actionable variants? <laughs> Isn't that what we're trying to generate? So, <laughs> so in, 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 in other words, um, are, are there studies of... Um, um, how, how the consumer uh, reacts to um, the different options of an informed consent. Um, informed consent very uh, uh, open and liberal, and an informed consent that's very restrictive to um, a few genes, and, 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 and how the consumer could change his mind if, um, if there's a, an in-depth explanation to uh, yeah, well, a couple of things, the, the, um, uh, the breadth of consents that are being used is pretty wide right now for the clinical exome. Some of them are very, very long, six pages, you have to sit down, probably take a couple hours to go through them, others are fairly short. From my own personal experience doing consents with exomes, I'm sure other people have uh, such experience too. It's it's like Huntington's testing. It's really dependent on the family. Highly variable. Some families, you know, don't tell me. I don't want all that detail. Just do your work. Uh, all the way to the other end, where people are still asking you questions three hours later about this little the piece. The engineers, uh, in particular. 
David, did you want to comment on that in the order? Yeah, I did. Um, so, I mean, I think there are two things I want to answer Ben's statement. For our clinical lab, we report back what areas of coding regions of genes we, so we do whole genome, but we report back in our report. So we require the physicians to provide a list of genes that they think are relevant to the phenotype. So we don't think that should be a lab responsibility. We think that should be a clinician responsibility. We actually return back what exons of those genes were not covered to a point at which we think we could reliably detect a heterozygote. So that's the way we, we define it. Um, in terms of the, the ethics and consent, so our, actually our consent form for, is, is a single page. But it, we take a lot of time getting to the point where the parents, um, in the case of kids or the adults, can fill it out. Um, we have a, I think, probably one of the most liberal policies to data return in our lab. So we will return secondary results that are adult onset that are untreatable to, par to parents of a child. Um, um, and we find that there's a huge range um, of what parents want, and it's not predictable when they walk in the room what they're actually going to walk out signing. Uh, we have a huge degree of concordance typically between parents, but there's no concordance really across different families. So it really seems to, to reflect families. The vast majority, more than 95% of people we surveyed, we've surveyed I think like almost 1,000 healthcare providers now as well in separate surveys, more than 95% believe that the secondary results should be available, and more than half actually want untreatable and or adult onset results if they had a, their child sequenced. And we see a very similar thing with parents that more than half elect to have adult onset results returned. Les, you had a comment? Yeah. Um, so the f what I originally pushed the button for uh, was the, uh, you mentioned the uh, 2007 ACMG mutation categories. Uh, just an FYI is that those are, of course, those were, of course, drafted probably between 2005 and 2006 when we all should have been aware of this but apparently weren't, that the presumption of known pathogenic variants had a lot to do with reality. And now we know that that's not true. And those definitions accept that presumption. And I think uh, it's now well appreciated that that's not a really great presumption. And so uh, my understanding from Mike is that the college is now going to uh, dive back into that and revisit those. There's also some issues that those categories are not mutually exclusive of each other. So it, they're a little bit problematic. So I wouldn't um, just jump on those as um, uh, truth. Um, yes, there is a group in the college working on a list of secondary variants that uh, the college feels should be returned in essentially all genomes or exomes done for clinical purposes independent of the indication for the original test. It's a, um, how long have we been working on that, Heidi? About a year and a quarter? Yeah. It's really hard to do. And there are some things that you can jump on pretty quickly that you can get to agreement fast. And then there's a lot of things on the edge that you can argue about until the cows come home. Um, so we're taking a very uh, narrow approach and setting that threshold high enough that we think very few people will disagree with the list. But it, there will be a list coming. It's always, it's been three to four months away for about nine months now. Uh, so it should be coming. What's the order of magnitude length of that list? Is oh. it 10, 100, 1,000? It's less than 100, much less than 100. I, I think is this, the... Is this, a list, is this a list of genes or a list of variants? Uh, it is not a list of variants. Uh, it is a hybrid list because you have to be very careful about whether you talk... For some genes, it matters a lot whether you're talking about genes or the phenotypes that are caused by mutations in those genes because those don't map one-to-one, -one, as you well know. And so different uh, disorders are being handled differently in that respect because it's a really important question. And then there's which variants in those genes are included in the recommendation that they should be returned. And some of them, we know what kinds of variants there are, and we've talked about a lot of those issues, but there's a lot to it. I think it, it might be worth just underlining, it's, it's, this point's kind of been made by two or three people together, but the, the difference between a discovery study where we'll start by taking raw reads and mapping them to a reference and calling a variant file and working from a variant file and a clinical environment where that is not the appropriate standard 
the appropriate standard is to know what the coverage is for every, at every base and at every position you're interested in, what the quality score is for that. Uh, and so you need to know what, what you're missing and what you're not. And so pulling genotypes for known locations is one of the first things that we would do with any new genome, which is a little different from the discovery-based approaches. Can I ask why we don't do that for array CGH? Yeah, why, do we, why, why don't we pool every single? We don't have those. At, those data are not available to yeah, clinicians. Yeah. Yeah, so no. if, I, you know, if I'm looking it's at something for LOH, I have no idea if that, yeah, no, it's that probe actually worked or yeah. not. Well, I think that, that, that probably that technology, to an extent, was the, was the, the first te high-throughput technology that was in the clinical uh, domain. And so I'm not sure that we're any, any, it surprised everyone in a sense that it was there. So I'm not sure. I think maybe now we're going back to think, what are the processes that need to be in place to deal with high throughput tools, high throughput technology in the clinical domain? And is it, there's a number of questions like that. I've asked the same question when people talk about uh, secondary or incidental findings. <coughs> the array CGH people don't seem to be the slightest bit concerned about that yeah. question, and the sequencers are obsessed with it. Yeah. I don't understand how that works out. Uh, David, did you want to comment directly to that? Question? I was just going to say that for an oligo array, at least you're doing multiple tests in the same area. You can look at fluorescent intensities, maybe a hundred or a thousand, or across the area you're looking at. And in the um, there's a smaller amount of information per base potentially, I guess, for for this. So maybe that's reassuring, but I don't know. Yeah, just to address that, my feeling is it's a simpler environment because the thresholds are set by size primarily and not necessarily disease. And so it's easier to come to a standard sort of feeling about, OK, we'll return anything that is larger than x or has a certain number of probes contributing to the, to the, um, to the result. Um, and it's a much simpler thing than 4 million variants being called in a genome and how do we figure out which ones to convey back. And so I, th I think it's just a, it's a different question that's been addressed. But, th but the other thing in, in talking with you know, this issue of distributing the, the raw data um, from a clinical test for additional analysis. When, you know, we brought that up as the sequencing group, the, cl the cytogenetics group was very much against the distribution of the raw data set. Um, and, and their arguments were, you know, we each use different thresholds and different QC and different this. And if somebody took our data set and put it into their algorithm, they get something different. And then there'd be the liability of, did you not call this? And there's all, you know, and, and then, of course, those things are true also in the molecular sense, that we use different aligners and different variant callers and different thresholds. And some might be a lower, but Sanger confirm everything. Some are higher, and they don't Sanger confirm. And so it is tricky to, to sort of say what's appropriate in terms of just saying, yeah, you can have your data. And is it annotated data? Is it reads? Is it, you know, what is it you're giving out? And, you know, when we look at a genome with variant calls, there's lots of loss of function variants being called that are you know, pseudogene misalignment, there, you know, two bases got called as independent variants when in fact it's a two base substitution done as a silent variant. And, and, you know, this could be throw people off if they see all these, you know, that a quick scan of whatever database says that that's disease causing. So it's, you know, I would, I'm fine giving really, really raw data out, feeling that the only people that can make heads or tails of that are people who understand the limitations of the data. But, you know, giving out annotated variant data sets that we have not looked at that from a quality perspective out to other people, that scares me. And that's where I would, I would rather give the very rawest data out than give this sort of intermediate level that doesn't meet the quality threshold. Um, so I guess I was responding to Ewan's point, but now I'm quite, not quite remembered exactly what I was going to say. But um, I think uh, basically the long and the short of it was, well, the goals of, you know, the research and clinical enterprise may need different outputs at different times. I think by and large, we need a, an extremely overlapping and common set of tools. I mean, there's obviously no reason why either one of those activities could possibly want to use anything other than the best-in-class algorithms for extracting the data from machines, for calling variants, X, Y, and Z. In many of our research studies, we find ourselves, you know, wrestling with, you know, conditions, either individual cases or groups of, of patients that, 
um, have similarity to existing conditions. And, the, and absolutely, the first thing you would want to do is have a clear assessment of the coverage of not only every exon of genes known to be related to that field, but every known mutation um, in, in those areas. And I don't think these are tools which are only suitable to one or the other of these activities. And the more that we can, you know, uh, build common strategies to tackling some of these problems, the better position we're in to sort of enter this reality where clinicians are constantly bringing all of us cases that we can't immediately say whether this is a diagnostic test we're running or the expectation is this is probably going to end up in research and we'll need to match up with lots of other people working with similar cases. I might note that we, we haven't really talked much about quality control here or quality standards other than to say there should be some and we should all adhere to the highest ones. Um, and I have, have the impression that there, there are, well, um, that there are, are other groups that are discussing and, and publishing on those. So, so just to be sure that we're not missing anything, do, do we all feel that that's being adequately covered elsewhere and simply saying we should adhere to some or somebody should adhere to some and they should be the highest um, is enough or do we need to discuss that here? Excellent. I'd be interested in your opinion about this, but I, I don't feel like that there are that there's a uniform enough standard for for quality that that can move between centers. Yeah, we came right. to the same. Con oh, sorry, we came to the same conclusion. We were writing the guidelines. You know, there's this question of should we recommend a minimum coverage and a minimum this and a minimum that, and that the challenge is each of the technologies are different and what you call as the minimum varies across platforms and, and approaches and they're likely to change rapidly. So we made the decision that the lab had to clearly validate and you know argue for what their technology was capable of doing and we gave some examples um, given that a lot of labs are using similar technology. So we, we sort of said some labs are taking this approach to just say, to give some, because people really wanted us to say something concrete, but we just felt that that w was not doable at this stage. So I just want to say in relation to quality, I just want to re remind you of the very good point that Daniel made earlier that in a lot of these really uh, functionally interesting and important regions, the error rate is going to be much higher. And, you know, I think that's an important message from this group that, you know, you can get overall a very high quality data set, but of course, on the regions that are most functionally important and whatnot, the error rate's going to be a lot, potentially a lot higher, and somehow that has to get factored in. It really, not the error rate, but the proportion of findings yeah, yeah. that are errors, yes, which is yes, yeah, yeah. A, little, a little different, yeah. <clears throat> so I, I think the, the error rate as well, my understanding is that because of things like CG content and stuff, I, close homologs. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. kinds of stuff. So it's not just it's not just the uh, the prior probabilities, but also the raw error rates. I think are tougher in genes and things like, and control regions. It's very ironic and sad. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, they're less repetitive though. So they get you'd get a big win. I mean, our major failure right now is in mismapping of reads rather than making sporadic base call errors. So. So, so I think from a from a clinical lab versus a research lab, there there are two very different ways of looking at it. In, in a in a research setting, we're obsessed with false discovery rates, and not trying to find something that isn't real. In a clinical lab, you're very concerned about missing something that is real. And so the way you tune your software for variant calling is going to be very different when you're trying to minimize your false discovery rate versus trying to minimize your false negative rate. You know, most clinical lab directors will have the opinion of, well, if we just do an extra few Sanger reactions, well, it's a bit of money, but okay, I can live with that. Um, so so I, I think there, there is actually a difference in the, the worldview. Also, clinical labs are bound by a bunch of rules that require obsessive documentation that doesn't necessarily improve quality, but is required. I think one of the things that we found when we moved into this world is also the, the shall we say, the versioning um, is less than optimal within the research sphere in terms of actually working out exactly what database was used underlying what and being able to go back three months or six months and say we can do the exact same analysis again because we have the, the tools um, such that we actually brought copies of all of the, the databases in-house so that we could version them. And so I think that's not quality in the sense that if you don't have version control you're doing bad science but it's a problem from a regulatory point of view if you've got to prove. So I think there is some differences in, in clinical versus research that, that are not necessarily obvious and don't necessarily affect the quality of the result. 
but do affect the rules that you, you operate under. I think what I was going to say is redundant to what, what's been said, but you know, th the measures of quality for this data are, you know, what's a, an achievable standard is changing very quickly. You know, when, when Daniel wrote his paper on the thousand genomes data, you know, he said that actually half the uh, stop variants and so on that we originally reported were, you know, were errors. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, more recently, we, we, you know, we, we set out systematically to find out how well we were doing with calling uh, insertion, deletion, polymorphous, which would cause, you know, lots of frame shifts, lots of highly interesting variants, you know, and uh, in our data set as of, you know, a year ago or nine months ago, it turns out that probably 90 percent of the frame shifts were not correct, you know, and probably half of all indels were not correct, you know, and this is taking the consensus of the five best available methods and so on. So it, it, these are hard areas in some way, and it's, it's actually good to try and systematically quantify what you can do, and, and th there is sort of a temptation to always say, you know, we can get 95 percent of the stuff or, you know, we've got a, an error rate of one in a million, and, you know, and it's probably not there. Um, I just want to amplify on, on Gasala's point is that, you know, I do think now in this sort of, um, how should I say, uh, era of personal genomics, people just have this assumption, oh, it's no big deal to sequence something, and they don't really think too much of the, what does it mean to sequence a genome and the quality of the underlying thing. And I do think that, you know, it's good having some standards for, you know, what constitutes resequencing a genome, what constitutes doing these things that, you know, that are useful for publication and reporting results. I was just going to say that I think the problem is that there's really no getting around the importance of sort of knowing what you're doing because um, it, <laughs> it really is true that um, there are situations in which you want to you want to maximize sensitivity and so you say you know it's actually okay that I've got a lot of false calls in there because uh, you know whatever comes out I'm going to look at it and uh, if I'm interested in it I'm going to sang or confirm it before I do a darn thing. And that would be a very ap appropriate decision to make if you were sequencing a child with an undiagnosed condition. You'd say, okay, I'm just going to call everything and then everything I'm interested in, I'm going to follow up. But the problem then is if you sort of go that route, then people start, you know, d using those kinds of standards for calling and making arguments about differences in the load of certain kinds of mutations between, you know, cases mm -hmm. and controls of a certain kind. And so that means it's very difficult for us to say, look, here's the standard for how you ought to sequence genomes. That's really tough. I think what you have to do is say, look, you have to think really hard about exactly the way you're using the sequence data and act appropriately given how you're using it. Yeah, and I think it's also, this I actually do think is a little bit different between following up variants for Mendelian traits if you were trying to look at segregation through a, fa a family where first you could be, you know, very strict and see, you know, see, see what you find and then you could loosen up your criterion. However, I think when we're testing for variants and we're using a burden or aggregate type of test, it's a different ball game. I mean, because you don't, and it's a very fine line, and I don't really know what that line is. Um, so it's, you could overly clean your data, but then, yeah, your, your, um, your false positive rate is really low, but your false negative rate is very, very high, and that will kill your power. And I think, you know, you, we're going to be a little bit robust to, you know, a certain percent of uh, false positives there, but, you know, we can't have our test overwhelmed by false positives. So it's, it's very hard to say how you would properly QC, QC the data and have, have that balance. And I think for complex traits, in a way, it's much more difficult because we're analyzing variant sites um, in aggr aggregate, you know, and we certainly wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do different <laughs> iterations of cleaning the data and retesting, so that I would not advise. I mean, I guess in the clinical setting you do have the safety net of, of having independent validation of, of those variants, which you won't have in a load-based yeah, association test. You might have like a, an overall sense of your false positive rate, but not every single variant. Right, right, yeah, because you, with a Mendelian trait, you, you could follow it up, it's mm -hmm. more work, but it's definitely very doable, and especially if you're working within a a small linkage, a smallish linkage region, it wouldn't be that many variants to follow up. <laughs>
I think just to, to, to answer your question directly, it's clear from the discussion that probably uh, including um, some of this information and some of this discussion on quality would be a useful thing, I think, for this document. In particular, it's another nice example, I think, of, of the two worlds sort of meeting in the middle uh, in the sense that uh, some of the things that the next generation sequencing technologies are, are very good at and where the focus of a lot of discovery has been on single nucleotide variants are the, are the places that have been the, the, these variants have traditionally been viewed as, as less important than the ones more likely to frame shift, which are the indels that we've been traditionally not very good at in the next generation. So put that together with expansion repeats, which are also beyond a certain length a challenge for next generation technologies. And I think we have some significant limitations to what can be done that are not really being talked about uh, very much. So I think this could be a, a useful forum to, so to do. Can I, can, can I make a specific suggestion just to throw it out there? And you guys can say this is, this is not sensible. But you know, in, in many areas of medicine, it's it's common to think about getting a second diagnosis, right? You know, there's no reason why we couldn't say, you know, e even for something like the genome, you know, if you're getting a diagnosis, you could consider getting a second one. You know, there's no reason why you can guarantee that the first one is the definitive be all and all because of all these things. There's errors and technologies change and so on. You know. Well, in Well, you but know, David, I mean, I mean, think about how you work. You work clinically. You, you get a, you know, you get a weird clinical test. The first thing you do is you repeat it. Absolutely. Uh, no, no. I mean, but you know, when you look at, um, you know, if you, if, you know, uh, David Goldstein put an example of a particular family that had a child with a condition that was hard to diagnose. Right? They went through, you know, many, many different genetic tests. Actually, May, not just two, maybe like five or six or something. I, I just browsed the blog before they got to the right one, you know? And so, I don't know, I mean, I, I, th I think it in, in medicine, and probably in many areas of life, you know, things are not as definitive as we'd like them to be. You know, if we had a perfect genome and we knew how to interpret everything, great. But, you know, but it's not there, and, and probably you'd get, you have to get the two clinicians to talk to each other and figure out the difference. It doesn't seem such a, an impossible, unreasonable thing to, to figure out. But the, the problem the, the limitations or even systematic errors might be pretty correlated across the different, um, you know, exome-based attempts at a diagnosis anyway, in which, in, in which case there may be less, less benefit there if, the, if that's the case. So I, I was about to jump in and, and tell Gonzalo it was a really bad idea, and then I kind of thought about it for another second. So, I mean, the, the, so there's a false negative issue and a false positive issue in, in thinking about a second opinion, right? So for a, for a false positive issue, it seems like a Sanger confirmation would be a much simpler route to, to getting to a answer, right? And then, but for a false negative issue, that's where a different, and then I guess you could also break it, you know, what does it mean to get a second opinion? It's the act of sequencing in a different place with different tools and all that, but then there's also the analysis, right? So you can imagine someone who just have a different interpretation of the same data. So you wouldn't necessarily have to even generate the data again, you just take your data somewhere else and get it reanalyzed, right? So we had, we had less and then Joel, I think. Or, or I was going to change topic. Is there Joel, did you want to speak to, to this? Yeah, I guess just more on sort of second opinions. I think it also speaks to the idea that the patient should be able to have access to the full set of data that would, be, would allow them to go to, you know, just the same way, you know, you could have your CAT scan and it's read by a radiologist in one hospital and then, you know, you take it to a radiologist in another hospital and they, you know, they'll look at it again. Um, and, you know, I guess even repeating tests sometimes we do, you know, if there's a biopsy that's indeterminate or something like that, then sometimes people need to go back for that even though you prefer not to. Um, but I think in terms, I think it does speak very strongly to the idea that regardless of what's reported back, patients should have the option of getting all of that information at whatever level they want it. I just want to comment on your third bullet which I think is an incredibly interesting question um, that might warrant um, some input from a group like this. It, it is also clearly a need for empirical research into this question because it's, it's not an easy question, I don't think. But one of the considerations I've been struggling with is arguments with folks who will tell me things like, oh, we have to control how this testing is used. And I have to remind, these are usually non-medical folks who will say this, and I have to say, you have to realize that once a test is clinically licensed or available, any clinician can use it for any purpose they see fit. And, and 
we therefore cannot control it. It's, that's by design of the entire system, and we'd have to change our entire system of medical training, medical licensure, and control of tests if you want to actually control that. And I'm not sure that that's even feasible. So that third bullet, though, is a potential uh, answer to that question in that what clinicians, frontline clinicians, almost always tell us and when we've worked with them is they want the answer boiled down to the simplest, plainest statement of what the test means and what they should do. And I would suggest that a consideration is, is there may be good reasons to mo definitely not do that with this kind of testing and that you should present, uh, like your, that paragraph slide you had, Heidi, which had all of the reasoning and all of the dimensions of considerations that go into interpreting these tests are, are how we actually think about these things. And, and that's, and if you're going to get a right answer, you actually do have to consider all those variables in the context of the clinical situation you're in. And so sort of forcing the issue of making it clear to people in how you present the result, that you actually have to understand and be able to think about all these things to use these data. There's merit in that, and we shouldn't <clears throat> oversimplify that and just give it in too simple of a fashion. Yeah. We, we uh, do need to move on, but, but we had Russ and Heidi, so, and David. Um, so we're, I'd, I'd love to hear clarification yeah. on that point. Okay. Yeah. Just to very quickly agree with that, uh, I'm aware of a, of a pharmacogenomics study where there was supposed to be a very limited intervention in a, in a single clinic. They announced it at a staff meeting, the availability of this pharmacogenomic test, and they closed down the entire operation in two days because every physician who had any patient that they were even considering using this drug on had ordered the test and they had brought the lab to its knees. So that tells us a few things, that physicians are very eager to use genomics if you offer it to them, but be careful what you offer because they will order stuff, and then we're really going to be left with, with this problem. Just to comment on Les's um, thought about, you know, these not simplifying the reports too much. So I, I agree with that, and it's, I, I do feel that there needs to be significant evidence-based, you know, logic in the reports. But, you know, if everybody read the news that came out Monday about the, you know, patient who had cancer because somebody misread the report, you know, we try and balance and have an overall result that is extremely simple and like the report starts with one word positive negative or inconclusive and then we go on to explain why and and in in coming up with the recommendations we made a recommendation that the that the report should start with a simplified statement understandable to any clinical you know clinician and so we gave examples of that like here you know for an exome sequencing test where you didn't find an answer negative and in an established or plausible cause of the reported phenotype was not identified, highlighted in a big, bold box. And then you go on to say, these are the genes we looked at, and this is how our algorithm worked, and da-da-da-da-da. And then the same thing on, you know, a positive, the example we put in was, and this was a case where we, f there was genes identified related to the phenotype, but the variants in those genes were unknown significance. So how do you give an overall result like that? And so we wrote, variants in genes with an established role in the reported phenotype were identified. You know, so we're trying to come up with simple statements that give the essence of the report so that there's not misunderstanding for the physician that does the five-second read of a report, but yet also arguing you really have to go into a deeper level of evidence for what your arguments are later in the report. So some sort of balance there is what I hope for. So we, we ought to end up with David, but I don't know which David. Uh, I, was, I meant David Valley, but David Adams has his. I'll, I'll, I'll just very quickly. I, I, I think Les made a good point about bullet three, that it's a, a topic that could be investigated further. And I hope throughout our manuscript we will make a number of points that the, there are certain these questions need additional research. And, and there's all the reason to, to do that, to move the field forward. And then I'm reminded by this last discussion by the by the paper now quite probably 10 years ago from Frank Giardello at our place who studied uh, molecular testing for colon cancer and looked at the level of understanding of the various people in the chain and the physicians who ordered it were down like 25 percent of them knew what they were doing and uh, the counselors did better and the patients were, were it just gives you an idea of the magnitude of the educational effort.
All right, thank you. Um, so I think we're, we're ready to move on then to our, our uh, last working group. Mark, you have the, uh, the cleanup slot here.